Karan was talking about a, an interesting uh, interesting study that he's working on. Karan, you want to talk about that a little bit? You can mention names here, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, um, actually, this is, you know, we all know that leaky gut is becoming one of the the hottest issues as it sets up the um, the inflammatory process, the systemic inflammatory process that is at the cause of so many different diseases, um, everything, all the chronic diseases, things like, uh, you know, even depression, anxiety, of course, um, neurological issues, but then things like diabetes, uh, cr um, coronary artery disease, you know, Alzheimer's, all these things. Um, so leaky gut is very interesting. Now, what, what I'm involved in, I'm involved in a couple of trials where we're, we're looking at studying leaky gut and mitigating leaky gut in human subjects. So these are, this is human clinical trials. Um, and, and as far as I know, it's kind of the first that, that has ever been done with this type of model. So we were looking at the ability to induce a leaky gut type of reaction in, in a healthy subject. Right, so we were trying to figure out, well, how do you induce that? Well, what you realize in looking at some of the data out there is diet plays a major role in how leaky or permeable your gut is. And one of the things that diet affects is the amount of LPS, lip lipopolysaccharide, that's released from your gut microbiome. So your microbiome contains, you know, somewhere in 60 to 70% gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria contain something within their cell wall called lipopolysaccharide, LPS. It's an endotoxin. So it's an endotoxin, meaning that it's a toxin that's built within the cell wall of the bacteria. The time that it gets released is when the, the cell dies. So the bacteria dies for whatever reason, whether it's an antibiotic use or from diet. So what we found is that if you feed somebody a really high fat, when I say high fat, I mean bad fat. So we're looking at omega-6 fatty acids, primarily things in vegetable oils, peanut oils, typical deep fried stuff that you find, you know, in, in many of these fast food restaurants and also very high in calories for a single meal that tends to create a massive die off of your microbial bacteria and subsequently a release of LPS. This big release of LPS in the body sets up an acute leaky gut type of syndrome where then you can find bacterial debris immunological um, activity from the gut in the circulatory system. So you see this huge inflammatory cascade that happens from that single meal. So we were looking at really high fat, really bad meals um, that we could do. And of course, one of the most potent ones that we found that induces this effect is a McDonald's breakfast. Uh, you know, and McDonald's breakfast. Yeah, of course. You know. uh, we can call it a mech inflammatory. You know, mech inflammatory. Uh, and, and here's here's the crazy thing about it, right? So, when I first started working with this group of researchers at University of North Texas on this on this study, what we found is that the effect, the inflammatory effect from a single meal, can be seen in the blood for over 15 days. Mm. From single meal, we can measure endotoxins, bacterial endotoxemia in the circulatory system for 15 days from one single meal. And imagine people eat this almost every day, some people, you know, even a couple times a week. If you're saying, ah, you know, I'm rushing out, I, I, I didn't have time to make breakfast, let me just grab a uh, mix something or the other or whatever it may be on the go. That effect can last for 15 days kind of the foundation of mood alterations. Now, almost any kind of meal you eat will increase LPS uh, secretion to some degree, even some of the good meals. Of course, the bad meals, much, much higher. Mm -hmm. But one of the effects I was telling Joe that we're finding is that good bacteria, like those found in the megaspores, spore-based probiotics, even some fermented uh, foods, um, not the bacteria within, but the actual nutrients, can have a dampening effect on that LPS release. And so if he's not if he's not getting the daily exposure, what could be happening is just a, a, a systemic increase in LPS that's going into the system that um, that can be creating some of these mood alterations. Interesting. So you say 15 days. Does that mean that the intestinal permeability is lasting for 15 days or just the inflammatory effects from that? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. So right. the we see a, a very nice curve. Um, the highest point of the curve is about three hours after the meal. But the rest of the curve takes probably about 15 days to really tamper off. Within about four and a half, five hours, you see it as a very low-grade uh, degree of inflammation, and that low-grade degree of inflammation can be measured for the next 15 days. Now, the problem with that is low-grade inflammation is at the, at the root cause of all of the issues with the gut-brain axis.
you know, and so and we can talk more about that when we get into specifics of each different types of condition. But uh, keep in mind, low grade inflammation is a major issue. Do you want me to talk about the um, general physiology of how they yeah. got into human? Yeah, and, like, and like neurotransmitters. Like uh, I know you've cancer. mentioned before that uh, certain bugs in the gut deal directly with certain neurotransmitters or affect neurotransmitter production and yep. um, maybe a little bit on how uh, our microbiome has evolved to trigger cravings for foods that they want. Sure, yeah. So so in order to really understand all the different lifestyle choices that can affect the what we call the gut-brain axis and how, how it affects the brain, it's important to understand the physiology behind how the gut and the brain are connected. And in fact, the more that people study it, the more they're starting to understand that it's not a gut-brain connection. It's almost They're almost part of the same uh, organ. So the gut and the brain are two halves of a central control system within the body. Um, the, the enteric nervous system, which most people are familiar with, uh, or hopefully they're familiar with, is basically a very elaborate um, collection of neurons that line that line up right behind the intestinal walls. So basically, all the way from your mouth all the way down to the anus, you've got um, your your gut barrier, and right underneath the gut barrier is the enteric nervous system. The enteric nervous system is a very very dense collection of neurons. These neurons are responsible for taking signals, um, chemical signals, and both uh, immune signals and also neurological signals, and carry it from the gut all the way to the brain through the vagus nerve system for the most part. Now, all of this is within the uh, autonomic nervous system. So these are all involuntary things. As humans, we don't really have any control of it, specifically like we do voluntary movements, like the movement of silver muscles and eyelids, things like that. Um, these are involuntary movements. This is part of the parasympathetic pathway as well. So the peristaltic activity of the gut is controlled by this enteric nervous system. Um, the motility, the other functionality, cramping, things like that, also are controlled by the enteric nervous system. Uh, a lot of a lot of chemical signals from your gut run up the the enteric nervous system through the vagus nerve up to the brain. So there's a very very direct connection between the brain and the gut. And in fact, it's still debatable who influences whom the most. Uh, there's there's a lot of resulting studies that are showing that the gut is probably more influential in the brain than vice versa. So the brain actually is a, um, a command center, if you will, that is looking for information. The brain gets information through your eyes, it get, gets information through your ears, uh, smell through the olfactory system, through the taste system, but a large part of the information the brain gets about the environment, the metabolic status, the energy status of the organism is through the gut. And the gut sends the brain all kinds of signals all day long about how to deal with things, how to respond to stresses, how to respond to in, um, adverse conditions, you know, how to deal with the types of foods that are coming in, so on and so forth. So that's a major connection between the gut and the brain. Um, there's a lot of complexity to it, and a lot of it is still being discovered right now. This is come, some of the hottest new area of science and, and research right now, the gut-brain connection. So um, a few things to keep in mind when we're talking about gut-brain connection, how everything is influenced. So a few things, few uh, terms uh, that are very important. So as far as neurotransmitters are concerned, uh, the first one would be BDNF. So BDNF uh, is basically a type of protein. It's a brain growth protein. Uh, BDNF stands for brain um, uh, neurotropic factor. So BDNF is a very important protein to increase the function of the brain, to increase synaptic regions, to develop more neurons, and in fact will help prevent some of the uh, neurodegenerative issues do related with, a uh, with aging and also with other diseases that are neurodegenerative like Alzheimer's. So BDNF is very, very important, and BDNF is produced by healthy gut bacteria. The other one is GABA. Uh, GABA, some people are familiar with, uh, but GABA is a neurotransmitter that actually calms the nerves down. So GABA is very important in terms of reducing hyperactivity of the neuron, uh, calming you down, allowing you to deal with stresses, and, um, and, and actually will have a de-stressing effect on the system. So that's another important one. And then glutamate. Glutamate is very necessary for memory function, very necessary for cognitive uh, capabilities for things like uh, 
problem solving and um, as I mentioned memory learning as well so the ability to learn new concepts interpret and understand new concepts learning your environment all these things are dependent on glutamate and glutamate is probably the most abundant neurotransmitter found in the brain itself glutamate is also produced by the gut bacteria another one is serotonin serotonin most people are familiar with serotonin as a happy hormone uh, serotonin is largely produced in the gut, so 90-95% of circulatory serotonin is produced in the gut, not in the brain. Serotonin controls dopamine and um, other such neurotransmitter activity within the brain as well. So ser low serotonin levels are associated with many different issues, you know, autism, depression, ADHD, ADD, those kind of uh, neuro uh, neurological disorders. So serotonin, BDNF, GABA and uh, uh, glutamate. If you just know those four things, you, you've got a really good stronghold on what is happening within the gut that is so important to the brain. Awesome. Um, really thorough. Uh, and melatonin, is, is, is there a link at all between microbiome and melatonin? I know melatonin is made predominantly in the gut, but I didn't know if it's microbiome related or just excreted there. Yeah, you know, that's a good question because I, I looked into that to f for some research on that. I, I didn't find much to okay. see if it's the bacteria making it or the bacteria stimulating the release of it. Um, like serotonin, for example, the bacteria stimulates a type of cell called the EC cell, which is part of your, your epithelial uh, lining within the gut. These EC cells actually make the serotonin, but they, are, they require stimulation from spore-forming bacteria in particular uh, for, in order to release it.